things have brought Brazil's really a front and center in, in the world stage. There's, there's a, a working agreement now with India, Brazil, and South Africa that really addresses almost moral, sort of what Lula terms um, geopolitics or um, globalization with ethics, bring, putting the human first in decisions. Um, but they're also just trickle down consumer goods. And I knew that Brazil had really, really arrived just four days ago when I went to the grocery store and I needed some laundry detergent and I walked by and something caught my eye near air fresheners, which I don't buy, but you can now buy the Brazilian Amazon in a can. <laughs> and it's the, the fresh scent of the blooming acai tree, right? And I'm sure pretty soon you'll, you'll all have the smell of acai. To me, it smelled just like the new car fragrance that was popular in the 1980s, so. Um, in my time in Brazil, and, and I look at Brazil through the prism of the Northeast. I, we had, Tyron and I went there and we had every intention of spending all of our time in all different parts of the country. Um, Anne and Rafi both did a better job at that. I fell in love with the Northeast and I just wanted to, to really stay there and understand that part of the country. I thought it was key to understand. And I looked at the lives of, I used the lives of women and children and adolescent girls to look at issues of the economy, education, healthcare, civil rights, and social services. And something that struck me, we talked a little bit about it on, on Friday about the language um, and how civil rights are spoken about in China and Anne was alluding to it yesterday and, and Rafi. What really struck me when I got there is how everybody had the rhetoric. You know, you can say, um, you know, I'm a citizen, I deserve this right, I'm empowered to do this, you can't do that, and really could stand up and say those words. Even the kids on the street, they would say to me, Tia, Tia, give me some food, I'm a citizen too. Those kinds of things. Or, you know, I deserve this, I do that. And they could, they could then turn around if you'd give them, you know, buy them a hot dog, which aren't hot, or something like that, and they would go off and then beat each other up to take each other's food, right? So it's not quite a, they haven't, hadn't quite internalized what the rhetoric meant. And I always thought that was, for me, that was an interesting point, and I think that that's true from the government level to the NGO level to the population. And what's, what still needs to happen in Brazil is the rhetoric to be internalized and owned and a true understanding to come to it at the same time um, that institutions, economic institutions, government institutions, and the popular mentality sort of mature alongside of each other. And I think the language that came out in the 80s and 90s of all of this new pedagogy and teaching people and empowering them and um, learning how to, to, to talk the right talk, um, that now we're in sort of the middle generation, people understand that it's important and uh, public institutions are actually starting to walk the walk. And I think it'll be, where it's a really interesting point right now for Brazil in the next 20 to 20 years, we're gonna really see things start to change more. And I have a few, few examples of where I think it's changing and working and changing and where that gap still exists. Um, in, in 1983, there was a woman um, from the Northeast, she was a pharmacist. And she grew up, she was in a very, very abusive marriage and it became a famous case in Brazil. Her name was Maria da Peña. Her husband beat her constantly and one evening in an argument, he shot her and the bullet lodged close to her uh, spinal column and she was paralyzed. <clears throat> she uh, tried to get legal action against her husband, nothing could happen. I mean, there just wasn't really any way that she could um, prosecute her husband or get anything more than a fine brought against him. It's very frustrating. So the abusive relationship continues and continues. She's in the bathtub one evening or trying to bathe one evening and he tried to electrocute her. So he tried to kill her twice, still operating with impunity and not, and not uh, punished. And the case goes on and on and on and on. It takes 18 years before she actually gets criminal charges brought against him and he spent less than two years in jail. So she got very little support um, from the police and the, and the formal situations, but a lot of women's groups encouraged her to take her case to the UN, and she did. And in 2001, Brazil was actually um, called out on it, saying that essentially because of the lack of involvement um, and monitoring of the violation of human rights for women and the, and the um, allowance for violence to be perpetuated against women, that it was essentially condoning it and something needed to change. So Lula comes into office and in 2003, one of the great things that happened was a Secretariat for Women's Issues was, was created. And the Secretariat got right down to business and started trying to acknowledge what kind of violence was happening, how it was being perpetuated, how could you hold people accountable, that sort of thing. And um, 
responding to charges from the OAS and the UN. And in 2006, the Maria de Peña law was actually passed. And that criminalizes abuse. It's no longer just a civil charge. Um, you, and if, there's a, if you're a victim of domestic violence, the person who perpetrates the violence against you, and this is, I mean, I think the, the, obviously the real thing is that violence can go either way. I certainly knew a lot of violent women in, in Brazil. Um, but the, for, in the case for women now, that you can actually prosecute your husband or grandfather or brother, whoever it is, with criminal charges, and they actually have to serve jail time instead of just paying a fine or sort of nothing ever happening. Special courts have been created to hear gender-based cases in violence. And really importantly, education materials have been developed to insert in elementary school textbooks, right? To talk about the respect for women, the lack of a, of a proper place for violence as a response. And um, the third part of it was that domestic workers were, um, were uh, given protection under this law, which is important. Six and a half million women work as domestics. Um, more than half a million of them are under 18 years old, and this law protects them from physical, emotional, and psychological abuse from their, from their employers. In 2007, Lula, um, still pushing, declared December 6th, and it's a long title, but it's the National Day of Men Working to End Violence Against Women in Brazil, sort of an, a public acknowledgement that everybody's involved in this whole thing and pushing towards that. But there's still some gaps. Um, oppor educa education opportunities and employment opportunities are still low for women. Um, there's a, a very low glass ceiling for management position, so it's still, you know, sort of fluctuating around there. Brazil is the third, I'm just going to run through a couple facts, the third, Brazil is the third um, largest uh, participator in, in sex tourism and sex trafficking, 75,000 women a year work, and most of this is concentrated in the northeast in the state of um, uh, Pernambuco and Bahia. 75,000 women a year participate in sex tourism in Latin America, Brazilians in Latin America, the United States and Europe. Um, prostitution is legal there. In uh, the fall of 2008, the Ministry of Labor made a little gap where they put some helpful hints on their website for prostitutes, um, encouraging them to dress nicely, to um, be clean, to get regular checkups for um, sexually transmitted diseases, to be tested for AIDS, and having a second language. It's my favorite. Having a second language always helps business. Um, they actually took that down off their website, which is good. Abortion is illegal. Seven, about 70,000 women die each year. It's at the level of being a public health crisis now in Brazil. 70,000 women die a year from abortions. They either die during the abortion or within 40 days after. But one of the most tragic <clears throat> facts about this is that 62% of the women that die from uh, an abortion procedure are under the age of 30. Um, Increasingly, houses are, are led by single, single women, which makes the education crisis really important. You know, where, so it's all, all interconnected and it would always make my brain um, spin. I told Rafi that I thought one of the most transformative things for him during his fellowship is how he was able to learn to think about all these different things at the same time and then spoke with them with such fluency last night. Um, but Brazil also forces that on you. You have to think like that because there's no way you can get through um, talking about one problem without talking about three or four other problems, which brings me to the Bolsa Escola, which is now called the Bolsa Familia, Bolsa, where um, it's, a, it's a scholarship. You get about 50 to $70 a family to send your kids to school, each child. So attendance rates are up, and Rafi gave us a number last night of 96% attendance rate. And the attendance rates are up, but so are the failure rates because so many kids are going to these schools, but a lot of times they're going only because they want the money, and they don't actually have the social support behind it for school to matter, for what is the priority. And then, of course, you get to the schools, and there aren't quality teachers. The textbooks that would tell you about the Maria de Peña La aren't there. Um, the teachers oftentimes don't show up. There's problems with paying their salaries. It's administered differently from municipality to municipality, so there's very little consistency. And the failure rates are up because they don't have the support and the top four reasons why kids don't show up. You can actually not go for three months at a time and still get paid. But the top four reasons, I think, are sort of indicative of how the social, this gap between policy and practice is still there, are basic illness, domestic violence, um, child labor, where it's not enough money to, to be able to stay in school, and premature pregnancy.
which I think sort of illustrates what's not happening 